Keith has welcomed you today. I do that as well. Didn't those kids look great? Guess what? So do you. I'm glad that you were here today. Let me pray with you. Father, we come here for you because you came here for us. You came and took on humanity. Your son came and completely divine, completely human, walked among those who loved him, those who hated him. You felt the, the pain, the temptation, felt hunger, felt thirst, experienced what we experienced. You became the perfect sacrifice. Father, we celebrate his resurrection today and your word that says he stands at your right hand and intercedes for us. And we want to share that again today, and we need to share it every single chance we get. And now as we do that, I just pray that the Spirit would fill this place, that it would embrace us, that it would guide us, that it would take that which I share, and Lord, make it yours and put it in hearts. And we pray that in your Son's name. Amen. A minute ago, I shared with the children about standards and measuring up. You know, it, it seems like life itself is a never-ending process of measuring up. It starts when we're young and we get measured up against the wall. And we're told what percentile we're in, whatever that means. Go to an amusement park, a child's got to reach a certain standard to be able to ride the rides. They grow older and they begin school and part of school. They're tested to meet certain standards. Throughout our life, there are standards that are out there by which our success and our accomplishments are judged. As citizens, we have standards that we have to live by and, and uphold to be a good citizen. And it just means that we're striving for goals and standards that are out there. And you know, our spiritual life, God puts standards before us as well, the things that we are to do. You know, but there's one standard that God holds that we can never, ever, ever achieve on our own. And that standard is righteousness. It's the nature of God himself. And is that which is necessary for us to approach him, to stand before him, to be a part of his family. And I want to share with you about that today, and I want you to hold on to that thought and obviously today is, is Easter Sunday, just a, a great day. We commemorate, celebrate sacrificial death, the miraculous resurrection through the power of God, of Jesus Christ himself. That which changes lives not only in the moment, but eternally. Today, throughout the world, thousands upon thousands of pastors and preachers are going to share Easter sermons and they're going to share the story and Lives will be touched and many will be reminded of the special gift that they have been given. What I want to share with you today is not new to most. And I can assure you it's not an attempt to preach a perfect sermon. But what it is is an attempt to share with you the why of what we celebrate today. So that we can better understand the depth of God's love and His grace. And so what we do here is not a momentary glance at a cross or a picture of an empty tomb, but it's lives that are transformed and changed because of the miraculous power of God himself. So we're going to explore that today and share that today. You don't have to yet. you got your Bibles. We're going to share a few scriptures along the way that really help us understand it better. But you know, when we look at humanity in general, I think generally... People like to talk more about what they are than what they are not. If you don't believe me, watch some of the presidential debates. <laughs> but you see, I think for us to really understand what Easter is about and what we really understand what we have been offered through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and to be able to overcome spiritual death because of his resurrection, we have to begin that with that question of what we are not the things that we lack and that aren't part of our lives because as human beings we want to be successful, we want to accomplish things and, and that's okay. 
But, but in our spiritual lives, it, it is forever important to acknowledge what we are not. Now, I thought about this, and, and I, I really was drawn to one verse that we share often, but I think just puts out there the totality of our condition. If you got your Bibles, turn to the book of Romans and the third chapter. And I want to share one verse. We'll go back there in a, in a little while and, and share some more of them. But one verse there that, though short in length, really tells us the whole story about humanity short of God himself. Romans 3.23, it says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, in, in, in the setting of what Paul is, is, is sharing here, no longer is there a distinction between God's people and the rest of the world. Every single person has within them a sinful nature that is attributable to the disobedience and the rebellion in the Garden of Eden. But you see, that sinful nature doesn't just lie dormant. At some point in life, it moves to sin itself. And it manifests itself in our not doing what God wants us to do or doing those things that he's told us not to do. And we can define it and we can describe it and do all of these other things, but in its basic form, sin is disobedience to God. And, and when we read this, I think it's important for us to understand this. When God says all, God means all. We throw that term around out there sometimes in, in limited settings and illustrations. But the reality is when God says all, it means all. No one, nobody ever is exempt from sin and the consequences of sin. And, and the presence of sin is not on a graduated scale. You know, if you, if you step back in our world today, you know what we like to do. We like to say, oh, this is really bad. This is bad. This is sort of good, and this is good. We just take things and we start putting them in these categories. But God doesn't do that. God says in his word that that which is disobedience to me is sin, period. And you can't limit the full consequences of sin by trying to put it into particular categories. And you know, the reality is that we live in a world that wants to say there are no absolutes. That is, nothing is absolute, nothing certain. God said, oh, yes, there is. There's a lot of things that are absolute. And, and here he says, everyone has sinned. And, notice what he said, and fall short of the glory of God. Now, that's really important because here he says, everybody has sinned. That separates us from God. God's absolutely holy, perfect, eternal. In our sin, we're separated from him. He says every single person has fallen short of the glory of God. And some might say, well, I knew that. I mean, we're not God. That's not the point of what he's sharing here. It's not the message of what he's sharing. When we speak of the glory of God, we're referring to his perfection. See, what, what Scripture says is God's holy. Now, holy in simplest form means to be set apart. God is unique, he is set apart, he is sinless. The psalmist described it like this. He said, the Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. Now, some may think this is an oversimplification, but here it is. God is there and we are here. He is above, and we are below. And when we read Romans 3, 23, the, the lesson that we begin with, it's all important that we understand is that on our own, we can't measure up to God's glory. It cannot be done. You can spend now to the last breath you have on earth trying to come up with one person who on their own innately measured up to the righteousness of God, and you will not. Why is that? Because God says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you see, if we left it at that, we'd walk through this life in, in sadness, and we would have this futile, never-ending struggle to try to measure up to a standard that we can never measure up to on our own. 
Because you see, in my sin, I cannot approach a sinless God. My heart's desire may be to go to him and to be in relationship with him, but my sin will forever be an obstacle that I cannot overcome on my own. And, and it's there that we have to turn our focus from what we are not to what he is, he being Jesus. And so we ask ourselves, if I can't measure up to God's standard of righteousness, what must I do to remedy that? Now, folks, listen carefully. What we cannot do on our own, God has done through Jesus Christ. Go back to Romans 3. Let's read a little bit more of that passage. And we'll go back to verse 21. And in Romans 3, verse 21, it says this. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, every person who has a sinful nature is eventually going to sin and that sin will separate us from God. And what we could never do, that is to pray the, pay the price for our sin, Jesus did for us. Now I want you to notice a couple of things in here. A couple of words that we don't really need to overlook, but perhaps at least one of those we don't use very often at all. And that word is propitiation. I mean, propitiation means an atoning sacrifice. Because you see, God's nature includes all of these attributes that he has. And one of God's attributes is justness. Not justice, justness. That is, his nature is such that that which is contrary to him, that which disobeys him, that which rebels against him, cannot go unpunished. It creates a debt for which there has to be a payment. And God is not one, contrary to what some in the world believe, who one day just says, oh, okay, never mind. Don't worry about it. I said it, I meant it, but I changed my mind. You don't have to worry about that. Scripture tells us that he is immutable. That means he never changes. He is constant. And his justice demands that that debt of disobedience be paid. And there has to be that which atones for, pays the price for our sinfulness. And only only a perfect sacrifice can satisfy a perfect God, period. That's why it's all important that Jesus, who became human, the incarnation of God, maintained his eternal divine nature, never left him. And scripture tells us that though he came here and walked among humanity, he never one time sinned, so he could be the perfect sacrifice for sin. The second word is justification. And justification is the spiritual process by which sinful humanity is made acceptable to a holy God. That which we can't do on our own worth, but Jesus did for us. And through the cross, he took upon himself our sins and he paid the price and he allowed us to be justified before God. Now, I want to share a couple of verses with you from Colossians. And, I, and let me give you a second if you want to turn there. In Colossians, the first chapter, a couple of verses that really set it out. What, what we've been sharing here and talking about in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, what we are offered through him. In Colossians chapter 1, Verses 21 and 22. Here's what it says. It says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach 
in his sight. Now, now friends, let me hone in on a part of that. He is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. See, God's ultimate goal in sending his son here to live and to walk and to teach and to preach and ultimately to be tortured, put on a cross, to die, was to pay that price so that we could be reconciled to God. And the cross on which Jesus hung and suffered and died made it possible for us to approach God in holiness, separated from sin and set apart to him. That, that cross allows us to approach God as blameless and without the blemish of sin. And that cross allows us to enter the presence of God accountable only, only to God. And what we could not do on our own, God did for us through Jesus Christ. Folks, just that's what it's all about. That's what we celebrate. That's what we remember. That's what we're called to live. That which I could never be, I become because of Jesus Christ. Absent his sacrifice, listen carefully, absent his resurrection from the grave, that would not be possible. If he had stayed in that tomb, we'd be here for a martyr and not a Messiah. But we're here for a risen Christ. And on Good Friday, we remember his sacrificial death as the only perfect lamb. Today, we celebrate his miraculous resurrection and what we become through him. You know, one of the questions you see asked, and maybe you've been asked this question before, who's the greatest influence in your life? You know, we see it asked in different settings, and, and people will answer it. And it doesn't matter. You know, some say, well, it's, you know, this one or that one. And then in sports, they come up with this person influenced me and all those kind of things. And, you know, from God's perspective, the question of who influenced your life the greatest there's only one answer and it's Jesus Christ that's it that, that's the one that he yearns for looks to and desires and, and standing before God and he looks to us and said who is the greatest influence in your life we must be able to look to him and say Jesus Christ you know I could like you tell you about the influence of people in my life parents grandparents Teachers, friends, the greatest earthly example that I have is my wife, Marsha. But when it comes to the matter of righteousness, there's only one, one that really matters, and that's Jesus himself. You know, I, I thought long and hard about what was to be shared today, and I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, you know what, what do you want me to share and let me tell you, folks, what we share today, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is timeless. And the reality is that every preacher who stands in the pulpit of a Christian church, every single time, ought to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I did that, the Holy Spirit led me to a verse. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And, and if you go out of here today with a verse, if you leave here today saying, this is what it was about, I, I really, really want you to remember this verse. We often say in here, if you are a Bible marker, mark it. And if you are not, mark it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If somebody says to you, what is Easter all about? Tell them 2 Corinthians 5, 21. That he took upon himself my sin and he gave to me his righteousness. What I could never be before I became through Jesus Christ. Now let me share with you one last passage of Scripture. If you'll turn to Romans, the fourth chapter. And these verses that, that reflect what we've been sharing, 
but kind of put it in the, the setting of what we receive through Christ's sacrifice, his sacrificial death and his resurrection. Romans chapter 4. Verses 22 to 25 say this. Therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. And now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Now the setting of that passage is that it's talking about Abraham. And it's talking about his, his faith. And that which became righteousness. And now it says to us, through Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in him, his righteousness is imputed. Your translation may say credited to us. And that's incredible when you think about it. You know, it's odd. when you, In the literary world, if you take credit for something else, it's called plagiarism. In many endeavors, if you take credit for what someone else did, it's called theft. But for those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, is the only son of God and the only means of salvation, it's called righteousness. And when all of life is viewed, that which truly matters, it comes down to the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we receive. You see, when we're done, folks, everything we've accomplished, every success in life, everything that we lay claim to here will be left behind. But let me tell you what goes with us, stands with us, and stays with us. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it is what we stand before, a perfect, sinless, holy God. And when I look up and say, I have nothing in and of myself that merits what you've done for me. However, because of what you've done for me, I stand before you clothed in the righteousness of Jesus himself. Because you see, folks, we can never say we are sons and daughters of our own righteousness. But we can always say as believers that we are sons and daughters of his righteousness. You know, folks, every week, Keith and Leanne, James, myself, we come in here and we have chapel for the three and four-year-olds in the daycare. Boy, that's a trip. And uh, when I get up and share with them, and at the end, I, I, I pray with them. I go through the prayer, and I get to the end, and I say, in Jesus' name, Amen. And all these core of the verses go, no, it's amen. <laughs> and I said, well, let me tell you something. And this is for you too. By the way, either is correct. Amen means so be it. So be it. And when we sing that song and come in this place and listen to God's word, here needs to be the results. So be it. And let me tell you today, when you hear that story, when you hear this account of Jesus' death and resurrection, if you can't say that, you need to say, so it will be. Because he offers it right now. You may have come into this place in your own clothes. You can walk out that door clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're going to take just a minute here to have an invitation. It's an opportunity to express to me or the staff, what God may have placed on your heart. So, so let's do that. Keith's going to leave. Maybe that you just want to bow your head and pray. If you need to sit down, that's okay. But if God tells you to do something, folks, and he's put it on your heart, yield to him.